so you know who I am, I'm Leah Levain, I'm one of the co-chairs of JVL. Um, I think our main speaker, John McDonnell, doesn't need much of an introduction, but just a, a reminder <laughs> that John was the shadow chancellor to Jeremy Corbyn's leader's role and was at the heart of trying to make a left-wing Labour government electable. Um, now, he has raised concerns about how the Ford report isn't being taken seriously um, and also about attacks on so many JBL members. For example, every single one of the 11 strong executive committee has had some form of disciplinary action or reminder of contract conduct. And three of us, me included, have been expelled, mainly for retrospective acts, which I hardly think is an untoxic atmosphere. Um, many of you will know Naomi. Um, she is JBL's media officer. Uh, she was elected this summer to the party's national executive committee as one of the CLP reps. And then, surprise, surprise, she was suspended just before this year's Labour Party conference. And consequently, she's not been able to attend any meetings. Uh, and so far, there's not been a hearing or even, I think, a response to her letter of appeal. And Miriam or Mickey David is one of our education group coordinators. She has many, many other <laughs> attributes beside that, um, a long and illustrious uh, academic career where she's looked intensely at issues of discrimination etc but she may say more about that or you can ask her um, but um, Ford did make specific reference to uh, the nature of the Labour Party's education or rather training on anti-semitism and made a number of points that would very much accord with the way in which we do education on anti-semitism led by Miriam among others um, so the Ford reports, 138 pages, at least 20 of which were recommendations. So I'm going to throw it over very soon to our speakers. What's happened to the recommendations and why does it matter out there for people who aren't engaged in the Labour Party? Um, and why is the media, do we think, all but ignored the report um, or indeed the Al Jazeera Labour files? And what is to be done? Um, you may not answer all those questions, but maybe in the discussion. So, John, welcome again, and you've got 20 minutes. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Okay, I'm not, not sure if I'll need 20 minutes. Um, I think there's still a rule in, in existence which um, basically debars any party member from appearing on a platform, a political platform, um, with people who've been expelled from the party. Let me just, I think that rule is still in existence. So let me just explain in case um, others might want to query why I'm here. Um, this is not me appearing on any platform as such with anyone. This is me simply engaging in a discussion about the Ford report, just in the same way I would with any organization within the Labour Party or beyond it about a report that was published by the Labour Party. Let me just make that clear, um, because you can never be sure how people interpret um, the rules of the Labour Party on issues like this. This is a discussion, it's not a platform. Um, I, as, as Leah said, I wrote to um, Keir Starmer um, because I was worried, and I, deeply worried actually um, over a period of time that the number of um, members of JVL and Jewish members of the Labour Party um, were being subjected to disciplinary action including suspension and expulsion and it was in some instances <coughs> and bizarrely for a Jewish party member on the basis of somehow undertaking under anti-Semitic acts. That was the first thing. And I, the second thing was, is that with JVL in particular, and I've met with the JVL founders from the very existence start of the organization, which I welcomed and supported, because I believe actually within the Labour Party, you need a plurality of views and if people come along and say, I want to set up this organization because we don't think our views are fully represented, therefore we're going to get people to do it. I, I welcome that. That's what a plural democratic party is all about. 
So I was really worried when I saw the, the, the number of members of a JVL executive against whom disciplinary action was being taken. And then when the um, Ford in inquiry was published, it seemed to confirm in many instances the concerns that people had expressed to me and that were causing me deep worry. And Ford was, uh, we've got to be clear about Ford was, and the Ford panel was established by Keir Starmer himself. It wasn't anyone else, it was, the, it was Keir Starmer's initiative. The Ford in, uh, panel um, led by um, Ford KC, as he now is, QC as he was, so a senior lawyer, as well as people you know, on that panel from uh, not particularly left panel or anything like that. They're from different wings of the party. So it seemed pretty balanced. They brought forward their report. They looked at the evidence. I believe they interviewed large numbers of people and they came to the view on a number of issues that there were matters of concern um, that, about the culture of the Labour Party. And part of that was, first of all, on one of the details that they went into was the factional use of the disciplinary process. Now, we all had our suspicions about this, but Ford confirmed our suspicions. And if you remember, some of you might remember that there was a, a, a number of people who were excluded or suspended from the party before the leadership election, after the coup that was mounted against Jeremy. And we thought this was odd that there was this number of people suddenly being excluded. Well. Ford confirmed that actually the disciplinary process was being used by individuals then to prevent people having a vote in that leadership election. It wasn't, we were suspicious of that, never really could prove it, but Ford confirmed that was the case. So the use of, he's, all, he's confirmed that the use of the disciplinary process has been used for factional purposes. So I naturally that reconfirmed my worry that this might be happening in the case of JVL members in particular. And so when I approached JVL and said, look, give me the numbers, um, the numbers that um, were produced were quite significant. We're talking about that stage, it was 57 members of, of JVL. And as, as Leah has said, sizable number of the executive members as well. So I, I wrote to, here and said this needed investigating. I was really worried that this was happening. Um, the other element of Ford, again, was again. I just find it. I found it just deeply worrying and quite extraordinary, really. That Ford simply said that um, with regard to how you deal with anti-Semitism, you need to be talking to a range of voices. And he specifically mentioned JVL because, like any person, he's thinking, well, if you want to know how your party members feel about these different matters, you should approach as many organisations within the party as possible. And so you shouldn't discriminate against an organisation like JVL. And then he, and he made this reference as well, which was interesting, to the hierarchical of discrimination being assessed and again, it sort of struck home with many people that maybe the whole issue of anti-Semitism wasn't necessarily being dealt with in a way that some would think it was appropriate, which led on then to his examination of what the party was doing in terms of training and, um, with regard to anti-Semitism. And he was very critical of the way that the party was undertaking that training. But, but the methods that JVL were using, he was complimentary of. So actually the Ford inquiry in many ways confirmed the worries that I had, suggested a way through, which was open dialogue engagement um, with JVL in particular, and also reform of the uh, training processes around anti-Semitism. So, I quite welcome Ford. I think a lot of people thought, well, he hasn't, they, the panel hasn't gone far enough. But I actually thought it was a step forward, at least opening up a debate and the opportunity then 
for the Labour Party leadership to, to get a grip of this and, and implement the Ford recommendations. Um, I, when I wrote to Starmer on this basis uh, and the response that I got um, really didn't take it any, any further forward. I was quite, quite disappointed really. Um, the next stage on from what I hear is that the National Executive Committee have considered the Ford Inquiry report and it doesn't look as though much of what Ford was recommending has been taken forward. So again, um, where I'm at at the moment is well, I'm waiting for the outcome of the final discussions of the NEC and what they're putting forward and how they move forward. But I'll, I'll, wait, I'll wait those final outcomes and then if I'm not satisfied as an individual party member about the uh, way in which Ford is being addressed, I'll then obviously start raising issues publicly and directly with Keir Starmer's one Labour MP, excuse me, one Labour MP to another, because I think this is such a fundamental issue. Um, if we can't treat people fairly within our party, what what confidence can people have when we go into government about our commitment to fairness and democracy in government? That's how significant this is. Can I raise one other issue as well, which has, um, has arisen? Some of you will see that there are real concerns about allegations about parliamentary selections at the moment. Well, again, I wrote to Keir Starmer saying, look, there's, there's all these allegations. And what I suggested he did was appoint like the trade unions and voluntary organisations to appoint an independent scrutiny to manage the parliamentary selections. But I also suggested to him that this is something that they could bring the Ford panel back to investigate as well. Um, I, the response I got was simply to refer my letter to David Evans, which is uh, odd because it was David Evans's organisation and management these allegations were raised about. So there doesn't seem to be at the moment on a whole range of issues where Ford has identified um, problems with regard to the way the Labour Party has treated its members, there doesn't seem to be so far, as far as I can see, much taking into account the Ford Inquiry recommendations or implementations of its recommendations. And that's extremely disappointing. Final point from me, really. I did try to get across in my correspondence with Keir Starmer the harm the harm that is caused to individuals um, by some of the actions of the party, and in particular, the accusation of anti-Semitism. I use Mike Howard as an example. Some of you will remember Mike, he passed away. Mike was accused. Mike was a left activist up in the Northeast, then moved south, I think, when he retired. Um, he, he was accused of anti-Semitism, a Jewish person himself, his, his family had fled here a few generations ago from pogroms in the East. He was accused of anti-Semitism. Um, action was taken against him. He appealed. The appeal didn't take place um, for 18 months and Mike died. And he, as his family said, he, he, went, he died still having this hanging over his head, which there's nothing worse, I think, within the Jewish community than being accused of anti-Semitism. Um, his wife then said they want the appeal upheld posthumously and then disciplinary action was taken against her. So I included that in my letter to Kia to say, do you understand the harm that this causes people, the hardship that it causes people? And if we're a socialist, we need to take into account people's feelings about this and therefore seek to ensure that harm isn't perpetrated on them and at least we do something to remedy that so it's it, it isn't just the hard material processes that that i'm challenging it's also this almost lack of duty of care to our own members when we're dealing with this issue that needs to be taken into account so that's where i've got to um i'm not going to let the issue drop i'll continue to work with JVL and others. I'll continue to ensure that there's a proper debate and discussion about the way JVL members have, have been treated and the 
failure really to respect the organization and the good work that it does even if even though the ford inquiry recognized that so i'll, I'll press on john thank you and thank you for being so succinct um i'm sure there will be questions for you i'm not going to comment um not my place i'm going to introduce uh, naomi uh, to make your contribution Thank you, Leah. Thank you very much, John. It's a privilege to have you with us, and I'm sure loads of people in the audience are delighted to have you there to, to respond to their questions and so on. So, um, well, it, it was striking to us that when the Ford inquiry eventually appeared in July this year, after a two-year delay, it was greeted with, well, I can only describe it as a yawn by the Labour right and the media establishment, almost without exception commentators accepted the party's very dismissive response and i've got quotes here keir starmer is now in control and has made real progress in ridding the party of the destructive factionalism and unacceptable culture that did so much damage previously and contributed to our defeat in 2019 end of quote that was the that was the party's response and i've now gone and lost everybody oh no there you all are good <laughs> um and that was the party's response in a few cases some commentators looked behind this studiedly sort of even-handed um superficial approach of ford and, and had a look at what had actually happened and i'll go through a few of the things as i think uh, john's mentioned a few but there were quite a lot of other points worth noting um actually andrew fisher former labor party executive director of policy was one of those who wrote about this at the time and has been keeping an eye on it and uh, so what we've got is for example poor behavior including racism and misogyny have been tolerated unless there was a factional reason to make political gain from challenging it some senior Labour Party officials actively tried to undermine Labour's 2017 general election campaign. Staff actively weeded out party members and supporters from voting in Labour leadership elections who might have been pro-Corbyn. Today, still, there appears to be, in relation to the use of sanctions on individual members, deemed to have supported newly prescribed organizations that's Leah's case and my case um, th there seems to be a reason for concern about that um board said that in prioritizing cases of anti-semitism the party was in effect operating a hierarchy of racism or discrimination where other forms of racism were being ignored it said that anti-semitism was being treated as a factional weapon as we've always known but the report's impact was lessened from our point of view, I think, by its insistence on a, court, a sort of equalism. So it sort of blamed both factions, and it did use the term factions for the weaponization, which seemed a bit strange to those of us at the receiving end of weaponization. Um, unfortunately, the report made no attempt to gauge the real level of anti Semitism in Labour, and it also gave the impression that those of us who claimed that it was being exaggerated were somehow guilty of denying that it existed. Ford doesn't tackle, for example, the prevalence of vexatious complaints in Labour's tragic anti-Semitism saga. And um, our web editor, Richard Cooper, said in an initial response to the report's publication that it was far too accepting of the view that statements that are unwelcome or found offensive by supporters of Israel, Jewish or non-Jewish, and those who define themselves as Zionists are or are very likely to be anti-Semitic. So that's a, a bit of a problem that the, the report doesn't deal with. Obviously, anti-Semitic behavior is never acceptable, whether it's the result of confusion and ignorance or malice. But, and Ford does make this point strongly, it must be dealt with via education wherever possible rather than by harsh and arbitrary discipline. This is perhaps one of the toughest challenges for us as JVL activists, to insist on open discussion and debate in an area where the scope of free expression has been almost entirely closed off to the detriment of Palestinians and those who work in solidarity with them. There's a crucial 
aspect of the Ford report, many commentators seem very reluctant to take on board. Um, some pundits, such as BBC's Michael Crick, for example, are now starting to acknowledge, as we've, we've learned through the sort of thing John was discussing, that Starmer's labour is proving worryingly unconcerned about democratic practice within the party, and therefore questionable as a prospective government of the nation. People are starting to say that. But Crick and others have not picked up on Ford's conclusion that essential elements in the media coverage of Corbyn's anti-Semitism crisis were inaccurate. And you'll all remember, I'm sure, a central claim made over and over again was that Corbyn and his team, including Executive Director of Strat Strategy and Communications, Seamus Milne, interfered in disciplinary process to protect Jeremy's anti-Semitic friends. This was the narrative. Ford concludes, that the media, that the narrative put forward about emails exchanged between Milne and senior staff in one crucial period, March to April 2018, was, quote, partial and misleading, close quote. That narrative was a central plank of the BBC Panorama documentary, Is Labour Anti-Semitic, which Forbes went on to discuss explicitly. Uh, according to the Jewish Chronicle, the BBC has made a formal challenge to Ford in a detailed letter, claiming that his report had done it reputational damage. So it seems that Corbyn's enemies remain determined to defend their own version of events, despite this uh, eminent panel having questioned it. Mike Phipps, who some of you may have read occasionally in Labour Hub, summarised the situation we now face post Ford by saying, the regime that Starmer has on, imposed on the party is one of the most factional ever with opponents expelled on flimsy pretexts, conference rules on parliamentary selections ignored, experienced members left off parliamentary shortlists on arguably factional grounds and affiliated groups paralyzed by right-wing factional control freakery, said Mike. So what should happen now? Andrew Fisher, who I mentioned earlier, confirms that reflection is necessary. Cultural change requires painstaking work, not glib assertions of change, which is what we got from that formal statement from the party soon after the report came out. Unfortunately, glib assertions of change are all we have got so far. And the crucial meeting of the NEC on December the 29th, just last week, made pretty clear that it's probably all we're going to get. This rankles with me because having been elected over the summer, represent constituency party members on the national executive. I should have been at that meeting, but my administrative suspension put stop to that. I'm still in limbo. Um, Left NEC member Jess Barnard was there and posted a depressing report on Twitter. NEC voted not to follow one of Ford's central recommendations, establishment of a new independent directorate to oversee the party's disciplinary and regulatory affairs. The party claims it is already doing what the Equality and Human Rights Commission told it to do about this. But as Jess points out, from selections to suspensions, it's clear that the party's processes are not being applied independently or fairly, but rather, in many cases, for factional gain. The NEC subcommittee has been formed to review other recommendations from the party. And this isn't good news either. It seems there will be no change for those waiting for months and months and months without getting any updates about suspension or appeals against uh, expulsion. Much, much needed democratic structures for BAME and disabled members have been ditched despite this contradicting Labour's rule book and agreements made repeatedly within the party over recent years. That's a shocking development given racism and Islamophobia scandals of recent months. As activists, we cannot let these issues drop. We need to communicate with huge numbers of party members who, if they knew what was going on, would be appalled by the lack of disciplinary justice and transparency and the lack of democracy or equality strands. Uh, Mickey's going to deal with a section of the report of great concern to us, reforming the party culture by means of a serious attention to education on racism, particularly anti-Semitism. We can't evade Ford's, the Ford Report's critique of the inadequacies, as John mentioned, of anti-Semitism education, 
which currently is under the sole guidance of the Jewish labor movement. I've nearly finished now. I learned that when the outgoing NEC met with new members for a handover session at Liverpool conference, I'd already been suspended by them. One of the left reps suggested that in the light of Ford should be discussions about education with JDL. We were met with snorts of derision from at least one prominent Starmerite. So we will have to work very hard to counter this contempt, the wrong sort of Jews. And I want to thank John for taking up the cudgels on this issue. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you, John, again. Um, I was a little bit more, more or less because John took less than his 20 minutes. Um, and I want to now introduce Mickey. Uh, to before Mickey before you do, uh, Leia, can I say we're not getting very many questions. If people want to ask questions of John or any of the other speakers, please post them in the chat and we will see them. Thank you. I, I don't see them, so I don't know how many or how few. But not, I've got loads, so but I don't want to. I don't, I don't want it to be my questions. Um, too many. Um, Mickey, can I uh, in, uh, welcome you to in, ask you to start your contribution? Thank you. Thank you very much, Leah. And it, I like uh, Nemi. Feel it's a great privilege to have that John here with us and that. Uh, I'm very uh, humbled to be able to talk with both uh, John and Naomi on this topic of the uh, Ford report. In a way, my anecdote that I want to talk about is a footnote to the discussion, but it illustrates the venom with which I think uh, JBL is, is held it's by other members of the Labour Party. Uh, in JVL, we were delighted with the uh, mentioning of including JVL in anti-Semitism education. Uh, the, the report itself uh, had many, several comments to make on education and uh, was highly critical of the work of the Jewish uh, labour movement and uh, they made six particular points about the problems uh, of the current approach to education uh, and they didn't want the adoption of a zero tolerance appro approach because it wouldn't resolve issues uh, and they also mentioned that the JLM's approach uh, should be one uh, that was not didactic and top down and one dimensional, but one with uh, forms of participation. Thirdly, they argued for uh, respectful dialogue, which is the ways in which we in JVL approach education. Uh, and they also added to that, that the model of education which is one that uh, requires engagement and deep listening by all participants, in particular to disentangle factional battles. They also argued that education is key to promoting personal change, rather than, as I said, rather than relying on zero tolerance approaches. And uh, the final two points they made, which are ones that we make very strongly, is that anti-Semitism education should not be divorced from all forms of racism and that such training should be based on an ethical stance that any form of racism is simply wrong morally. Uh, and what they finally argued, and I know that Naomi's already mentioned this, that at the moment, the Labour Party's current action plan is establishing a hierarchy of racism. And uh, although they argued they didn't take anti-Semitism seriously enough, now they've reversed that and anti-Semitism is taken much more seriously than other forms of racism, such as Islamophobia and racism against BAME people. Uh, 
so now I just want to mention uh, what happened to me uh, with uh, my trying to write a comment on the Ford report and its educational aspects. By chance, just before the report was published, my Jewish head of department had invited me to write blogs for University College of London's Institute of Education, instead of paying me for supervision of my last PhD student. This is a bit irregular, but as I'd written monthly blogs for the THE for three and a half years, back in the 1990s, I accepted with alacrity. I prefer writing blogs to supervising students, for example. So when Ford was published in July, I asked if I could write one on that instead of generally on the conditions of higher education today. Uh, and my head of department agreed, and I wrote it very quickly, uh, helped by Richard, Jenny, and Tony Booth, and sent it back to uh, my head of department before the end of July, and he sent it on to the blog editor. Uh, it's a version of what is already on the web, but a, with a key focus on our anti-Semitism education and how it fitted with what Ford called for, participatory education as good practice. When I hadn't heard back a couple of weeks later, I asked what was happening and the blog editor, who is another American Jew, uh, said that my head of department had sent it to the wrong email address, but she got it and would read it in the fullness of time. She came back to me quite quickly saying that she hadn't yet read the Ford report, but she thought that my piece needed A to be shortened and B to provide more explanation of the report as my piece wasn't clear enough for education readers. I quickly shortened it and sent it back whereupon she said she still needed to edit my piece to make it suitable for an education audience as they would have no interest in Ford. I was hugely affronted and said that this had not happened to me ever before with my blogs for the THE or for her. Uh, she then sought help from the upper echelons of the IOE, a young woman whom I also knew, and they both told me that I should send my piece elsewhere and it wasn't suitable for the Institute of Education. I should send it to Open Democracy as it was about politics, not education. Meanwhile, I'd sent it to a friend of mine who is Baroness Ruth Lister, who'd sent it on to the three other members of the Ford Committee, which included Baron Larry Whitty, who is the brother of the late head of the Institute of Education, and Baroness Deborah Wilcox. Uh, and when I told Ruth that it had been rejected, I got a one word uh, reply, shame, but I felt she probably felt similarly about how the whole Ford report had been rejected by uh, the Labour Party. To end the little story about what happened to my article, I subsequently discovered from an email that the blog editor had sent me six years earlier when I'd asked her to support a, a critique over the Brexit debate. And she'd replied to me, sorry, I think Corbyn is hugely culpable. If he'd done his job with conviction and persuaded working class people the vote might have gone the other way. So I realized that she was uh, an anti-Corbyn person and that was the reason for her uh, rejection of my article, not other reasons, which she dressed up in, uh, I can't think of the appropriate word. I also then asked to write a blog for the Times Higher Ed a month or so later. Uh, but my first draft was turned down for the Times Higher Ed on similar grounds. And I was told that I should write more on the IHRA definition and its uses and misuses in higher education. I've decided to pause my efforts on that one. So what I think in 
common with what John has said and what Naomi has said, the silences about the Ford report are deafening and are clearly because they il illustrate the shenanigans within the Labour Party and their factionism, and most especially from my point of view, amongst Jewish members of the Labour Party who are clearly not one Jewish community and it's factionalism amongst us Jews that also needs to be sorted out but somewhere other than in this public arena of arguing about what is and what is not anti-semitism. I think it's a very sad and sorry story. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mickey, to, and to all our speakers. Um, now, a number of questions are flying in, and I'm going to try and make some uh, some sense of them. <laughs> uh, I mean, they all make sense, but like, um, so that I get some order. Um, so I'm going to sort of start at the beginning with this is the question from Tony Booth. Um, and I'm not going to ask all three speakers to come back on it, and all three will have a time to, to answer some up. Um, so a couple of observations really from Tony, Tony Booth. Um, Martin Ford was threatened, he says this in the report, he mentions that as soon as he was appointed, he was threatened by some of those who had been mentioned in the leak report. Um, uh, and he was threatened before and during the inquiry. So do people think that Keir Starmer knew that was happening? And what are the implications if he did know that? Um, and what also are the implications? This is also from Tony. Um, what are the implications of the fact that Ford confirmed the overall veracity of the leaked report? Um, and what are they particularly what are the implications for the payout of members' money against legal advice to some of those who were named in that report? Um, I think this is probably more a question for John. I feel a range of questions for John, if you be able to come back on that. We have to be extremely careful about anything that we say with regard to the leaked report, because um, there's been, people have been incredibly litigious about the whole issue. So we have to be extremely careful. Um, I, I have no knowledge about um, threats or anything like that. All I can say is, even, disregard the sort of infighting within the Labour Party, the factional infighting that in the Labour Party that, that went on. Disregard that for a moment. Let's not get involved in that at this stage. Um, even commenting. Let's just go straight to Ford and the panel itself, because allegations about what went on here and what went on there are often dismissed as either because you're on the left or you're on the right. The whole point of Ford and it being established by Keir Starmer was that it was to rise above all that <clears throat> and address these issues as independently as they could. And we know that independence is, a, uh, is, is almost in, unachievable in many ways, but nevertheless, it was to make the best stab they possibly could at being independent and as objective as possible. So therefore that's why, and that's, ex that's exactly what Naomi and, uh, has done as well. That's why what we're saying in many instances, many of us, is that look, these aren't, our allegations anymore these are in many ways proven actions by an independent body established by Keir Starmer so in terms of what went on what Ford did was basically the panel looked what evidence it had it seems to have done quite a thorough job in doing that and it's come up with conclusions which, to be frank, most of us agree with, that there was factional abuse within the Labour Party that was used um, to undermine Jeremy Corbyn. And the hard evidence of that is the way in which the, the Ford inquiry itself confirmed the factional use of the disciplinary process. Now, this is, this is not 
any more conjecture on our part. It isn't any more um, us making allegations. It's an independent inquiry confirming what happened. So therefore, the onus then is upon the leader of the Labour Party and the National Executive Committee, of which he's a member, to actually then implement the recommendations that, that the Ford panel has come, come forward. It's, it's as simple as that. So I, there's no need to get into was Ford threatened, was he not, um, what he confirmed, what he didn't confirm. He just came along and made, the panel made its own mind up about what went on. And as a result of that, um, as a result of that, put forward, I think, what were some instances fairly mild mannered recommendations that in any reasonable person would think uh, readily implementable. And if the NEC now hasn't finished all its consideration of this, if the NEC is rejecting those recommendations, so, well, I think, I think we're in extremely difficult territory um, with regard to how the party um, goes forward on a number of these issues. Final point on the payout of the legal settlement. My understanding is the same as others, that um, the legal advice was that the, on all of this was that um, this was a case that could be fought and possibly won by the Labour Party. If that if that is the case, and we're not, I'm not completely sure. If that is the case, well, well yeah, I am a, as an ordinary party member. I'm worried about the way resources have been used in in that way. And again, that may be something that could be looked at at, at, at a later date as well. But I just, it's I think for most of us is that we seem to be following. Uh, uh, the rules in terms of how you deal with contentious issues. So um, almost religiously, we've really stuck to the way it should be done. And having stuck to the way it be, so should be done and having it all ignored, the whole process ignored in many respects by the sound of it, it's more than disappointing. It's, it's extremely worrying because what happens when there's a ne another outrage at a later date and we have another inquiry and then the recommendations of that inquiry ignored, that we never ever get to an even keel again. If this was happening in government, you know, we'd be outraged, wouldn't we? If there was an inquiry into, for example, the behaviour of um, the Home Office at the moment and on a particular issue, and there was in, uh, a whole series of independent recommendations made about what sort of reforms were needed, we'd be the ones jumping up and down demanding the implementation of those reforms. So we can't we can't just ignore the fact that an inquiry has taken place and has come up with sensible recommendations. And if they are being ignored, it becomes, as I say, I'm not giving up on this. I will keep pursuing it because it's just a wrong that needs to be righted. Thank you. Um, the questions are flying in. Thank you very much, John, for that. Um, I think you have touched a couple of times in your presentation and in your answers to, as to why it matters. But I wanted to try and group a few things. I say I'm trying to juggle a couple of things. But Lavina, I think it was, if I can get back to that question. So Lavina, sorry, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, has a question about what hope is there. This may be a question for uh, Mickey and um, Naomi. Um, what, what hope is there for the left when JVL members and indeed Labour Muslim network members like her um, are suspended and none of the submissions we and others made to the Chakrabarti report or Ford are considered. Both reports took our view, views into account, but the party doesn't. Um, I just want to say thank you to Lavina for raising Chakrabarti. So I've got almost a supplementary question, which is how much have we progressed since the Chakrabarti report, which is now six and a half years ago? Um, and a related question is whether I know that's a bit later. Um, yeah, whether it's appropriate that it's going to take, and John has touched on this, um, another year for the final adoption of recommendations uh, that will be far too late, given that there is an ongoing purge. And how long can one give Starmer the benefit of the doubt? Um, and Richard, uh, that's a question from Richard Cooper, and he also touches on uh, the importance of calling out the authoritarianism of the uh, of the party. So um, maybe not such direct questions, but I think both Mickey and Naomi may have things to comment on. Um, Mickey, do you want to go first? 
Okay. Uh, I, uh, I decided uh, to leave the Labour Party. I wasn't suspended. I'm too cowardly to make comments, actually, I'm afraid. Uh, but I left the Labour Party uh, it, back in January uh, because of the way in which my uh, CLP, I was on the general committee of uh, Hornsey and Wood Green's CLP, uh, Hornsey and Wood Green CLP. And there was a particular nasty incident over Holocaust Memorial Day uh, in which factionalism in the Labour Party was on display because uh, a rabbi uh, in my constituency was also on the GLC and he was on the right of the Labour Party. He refused to allow a socialist uh, feminist woman to speak about the experiences of women in the Holocaust uh, because she had made some statements about Israel-Palestine that he disagreed with. So he managed to uh, make our CLP, our GC of the CLP, it, uh, into a horrible debate about uh, these issues. And uh, he tried to get her frozen out and not give the talk. Actually, uh, our CLP uh, and the GC uh, were more left-wing and they uh, uh, allowed her uh, to speak. And a whole JLM group of my uh, GC walked out and it was a Zoom meeting, but they didn't listen to the Zoom. Uh, but Sue Levy Hughes gave her talk nevertheless. But it was the most distasteful discussion I could ever engage in, and I refused to carry on attending the Labour Party. I just found it despicable. Uh, so I, to answer Richard Cooper's question, I've already given up on the, the Labour Party, I'm afraid. I, ju I just find the factualism too difficult around anti-Semitism. But I do agree with uh, Lavina that we should go back to talking about the Chakrabarti report because I thought what uh, Shami Chakrabarti had to say about respectful dialogue and treatment uh, in education was excellent. And we have uh, used that in our anti-Semitism education frequently. And I think her report was treated almost as shabbily as now the uh, Ford report is being treated. Both Shami Chakrabarti and Martin Ford are barristers on a par with Keir Starmer. And I cannot understand why his Keir Starmer's legal training is leading him down such a uh, blind alley or whatever. He just doesn't seem to be using his legal nows to treat these issues uh, in proper legalistic ways. That's all I have to say, sorry. Thank you. Naomi, do you have a couple of points or do you want to hang on till later? Well, well just, just one point really, because I, I think Mickey's made a lot of excellent points there. Um, uh, th this question of um, giving, how long can we go on giving here the benefit of the doubt? And I, I do understand why Mickey and so many others are in despair and, and have decided that they're not giving him the benefit of the doubt anymore. There are, however, a lot of members still in the party who are wrestling with this. And um, I sort of hinted at this in, in my opening presentation. You know, if people understood the extent to which his demo uh, democracy is being overridden and the extent to which racism is not being tackled properly and so on, they would be up in arms. And I have personal experience of this with several individuals I know. I'm, I'm thinking of one person in particular who remains a member of the party, who voted for Keir, who financially backed his campaign, who's met him personally a few times but who is also very much an admirer of um, Sir Geoffrey Byman Casey, who um, also had, I mean, it seems patronising to say it to somebody of that stature, but had illusions in what Keir was planning to do with the party. And 
so, and now sees, I'm talking about the first individual now, sees that these two are now at loggerheads effectively. Keir Starmer is leading the party as um, Miriam said, Mickey said, down, down a blind alley. But those people are still in the party and I think it's our job to, to show them what, what, what is still to be done, what we can do, what challenges can coherently be made. And that's what we're talking about here tonight, really, isn't it? So, um, yeah, how long can we wait? Well, we can't wait forever. It's true. Uh, we can't wait forever. But, um, yeah, there is still work to do, I think. Thank you. Somebody, uh, Naomi Wayne, has asked a question, which I might answer. But it is interesting, I think, for um, people outside the Labour Party, which is... Um, how widespread is concern in Labour branches around the country about the way the Labour Party is being run? Well, I can answer that. That I know, for example, because of the um, what happened with my local CLP, which is Hastings and Rye, uh, about the selections that people have left um, who were not able to be selected. People who've been stalwart members, former councillors, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, have been so appalled at the lack of democracy that they have left. Uh, Naomi has another question, which is, do we know if branches or CLPs have organized discussions about the board report? It has been explicitly forbidden. It is considered as not fit business. And I think in terms of democracy and why it matters, why I think it matters, I've never, nobody I know who's been in the Labour Party for 40 or more years has known a period when the, the topic for discussion has been, topics for discussion have been dictated or, or by, by the centre. Um, so as I said, I know people who politically would not be aligned with uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who are as appalled by the lack of democracy. Um, so I hope that, that that helps. And I think it's an important point maybe to refer to um, this, this whole, centralized control has real implications i think um i i'm going to try and find another a question on a slightly different area um yeah okay well uh, there's quite a few it's hard, it's hard for, I'm, I'm looking at these on whatsapp so my apologies for that um so there is a question from sandy palmer um considering that ford ford was a delaying tactic in itself uh, maybe it's not so much a question, but what do people think? Um, so was Ford a delaying tactic in itself? Um, do we think that Starmer and Evans were disappointed with the report and are consciously trying to ignore and bury it? And how do we keep our focus on those broader issues around the factionalism <coughs> and the disciplinary process? Who would like to take that up? Shall, John? shall, shall I come in on that? Because yeah, okay. Thank you, John. Uh, when when Keir Starmer announced the Ford panel inquiry, I think I was like others, sort of naturally suspicious. Is this sort of like a royal commission that will go on forever and ages and ages and never come up with anything at all? And I got more anxious when it seemed to be going on and the report wasn't published. But eventually, it had to be published. And when it was published, I was pleasantly surprised. And I thought, well actually he has addressed quite a lot of the issues and the panel seems to have had a really quite a good and deep discussion about the 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 particularly the cultural issues within the party itself and them reasserting issues like the the party should be and to maintain its tradition of being a broad church and there should be respect for different views and then that was evidenced by the way in which they were they were you know recommending the dialogue with JVL and take into account its training methods, etc. So although I was suspicious at, at times, both about what was being used for and how long it took, as I say, I thought it was quite a breakthrough when it when it was published. Now, the issue for us now is its implementation. And that's the next that's the next challenge, really. Can I just say there are some within the party who clearly are working on the basis that they would like to eradicate the, the very presence of quite a number of us, in particularly those of us on the left. And I think that has to be acknowledged. And, and the statements that have been made from some individuals 
um, in the past who are close to the uh, uh, who are in in office now in different structures within the party who have clearly in, indicate that and I think what they're expecting us to do um, is first of all to sort of rant and rave um, so in some ways that then alienates and isolates us from large sections of the mainstream of the party. And I'm, I'm, I'm always careful about not getting too angry vociferously on this, but trying to use calm language and <coughs> not to rant and rave as some would want us to provoke us in, but to be, be, care, be in many ways, be careful in the language and but make sure that we are bearing witness to what's going on and people understand what's going on. That's the first thing. The second thing is obviously they, they're seeking to provoke large numbers of people to leave the Labour Party. and We've lost 200,000 members. And in many ways, what I'm saying to be, and I know I, know I don't in any way uh, castigate or blame anyone for leaving, uh, but I, it, what I'm saying to people is, yeah, yeah it is tough. and but. By leaving, you're doing exactly what th these elements want us to do, which is to hand the party over to them, lock, stock and barrel. And I'm not willing to do that. Um, it, this is this is my party. I've been in it 45 years and I'll continue to promote the ideas, the socialist ideas that I want the Labour Party to adopt no, no matter what. Um, so in some ways, I, I, I'm, I don't want people to fall into the trap of what some people have been setting us but i i understand completely how tough that is but the ford inquiry has become a real contradiction now for Keir and those elements on the nec who promoted it because the contradiction is it is their panel that they set up it is their inquiry and it is in effect therefore it is their report that that has been published so it's in their hands about the implementation of it. And it will, I think it will be seen as somewhat hypocritical of in the future if they don't implement their own, their own recommendations. And it's something that I think we've got to use to, to maximum effect to, to get through this period. And we will get through it. You know, I, I, we will get through. The Labour Party has gone through all different twists and turns in its history. And, at different stages. I think in terms of for the socialist left, this may be one of the bleakest periods, but we've come through it in the past. And the way we've come through it is by absolute commitment and perseverance, no matter how tough it gets. And the use of the Ford inquiry as part of the exposure of the, the failure to implement its recommendations is the failure to live up to the democratic policies and procedures of the party, I think is important for us to continue to expose. And in many ways, it's part of the political education of many of our party members or supporters about what a democratic party should look like and how it should act. And at the moment, in some instances, with regard to the Ford, that clearly isn't happening as we, sh as we wish. Thank you, John. I know Naomi would like to come back and please do so. Yeah, just just very very briefly. I remember when uh, when the inquiry was first set up, the Ford inquiry. I mean, um, I think what Starmer and friends wanted was an investigation into who leaked the famous leaked report. Remember that it was that was part of its brief. Find out who these traitors are who let this scurrilous document get out into the public domain. What Ford and his uh, panel did was actually to look at what the leaked report. Had, had said and evaluated, and they've evaluated it as we've been discussing in ways that are helpful to, to us because it shows that the factional abuses we'd already always expected, uh, well, we'd, sorry, can't get my words out, that we'd already, already seen in the operation were true. And then, so when the report was ready, the timing of the release was significant, wasn't it? Because it was on, I think, the hottest day of the year. And it was at a time when uh, Boris Johnson was just coming in as prime minister. It was a sort of ideal time to uh, to bury news. So I, I think this both of these things indicate what the leadership's intentions were with the report. But now, as John says, we have got it. It has been ignored. They're attempting to bury it. But it does give us some weapons in our armory to mobilize those remaining stalwart members who've still got a bit of fight left in them 
to uh, to try and get implementation of the important democratic uh, recommendations that it makes. Thank you, Naomi. I'm going to take a, put a couple more questions and then I'm going to open up. So some people won't have, I won't have asked their question. So if people want to make points, I will prioritise those people who have put questions in. Um, but I wanted to ask um, a question, um, hold on, I've got to get it back from, about the hierarchy of racism, um, which uh, Mike Cushman has asked, um, if I can find it quickly. No, I've lost it. They've all gone a bit weird. Questions, here we go. Um, so it's a question about whether there's any prospect of the party recognizing how the hierarchy of racism that Ford exposes is both a moral and an electoral threat to the party. Um, I don't have a great deal of um, confidence uh, after, after um, that. So I, I think I'll take that question and I'll put that to, I think probably John again, apologies. Um, and then I'm gonna take contributions from the floor. Um, because otherwise it'll all just be questions, uh, useful as they are. So, John, would you right, like well, to address the, the question about uh, the, the, the yeah the the brief response is actually the issue is not going to go away, and I don't think people will allow it to go away. Now, wh when the party um, uh, when the party re re responds to that debate, we'll have to see. But I think there are sufficient now that Ford is really place the issue on the agenda there's sufficient numbers within the party to who are really concerned about the issue that i don't think um they're going to let it drop and the discussions that i have with people is if uh, this is the point that was made earlier i should have addressed if the individual branches within the labor party can't discuss these issues are not allowed to discuss these issues um by diktat from the centre um people in their creativity find other mechanisms to enable that to happen and i think that's what's happened happening and it's happening through other organizational forms that people have established or other mechanisms other organizations they're involved in and other forms of formal and informal debates so i don't think that i don't think the issue is going to go away um and I don't think it can be closed down because it's so fundamental to about how um, a political party operates and relates to the to the to the real world out there. So yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not confident the party is going to address this in any formal way at the moment, but I am confident that the members of the lay party and our supporters and and our um, members of our affiliated organisations are not going to let this drop, and there will be a time where informally the party will have to come put it back on on the agenda because it's it's a matter of how we deal with the, our relationship to our whole community and it's so fundamental i i don't think i need uh 10 minutes uh for my feedback i think it's been an excellent discussion and so many points raised uh it's difficult to uh, summarize, but I, I do agree with uh, Richard Cooper, first of all, that the recommendations are really good. I think the report itself, although the way it's written is a bit uneven, but I think it's a really important report in, and especially in terms of ways forward. And it raises both uh, political and moral or ethical issues that I think we really need to attend to as much as it raises points about uh, the future of our fairness and democracy in the Labour Party. Uh, the second point I want to just uh, come back to is the point that Julia Bard uh, raised, which is why uh this what were the underlying reasons for the report as well as the points that david rosenberg made and i think that uh mm -hmm. fundamentally the uh the report and uh 
the, the position the Labour Party finds itself in at present uh, are more about, uh, not a, particularly about anti-Semitism, although that's a, a, an important issue to some extent, especially for JVL and other Jewish members of the Labour Party, but we're actually a very small group of people within the country at large, and I don't think anti-Semitism is really the key issue. I think the bigger issue is the one that David uh, raised finally, which is about the extent to which uh, the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn was trying to redistribute economic and political power. Uh, and I think that's pretty important, although I don't think in the long sweep of history he was being particularly radical. I mean, you just have to go back to the Labour Party in the uh, 1960s, for example, there's not much between uh, parts of that. So uh, I think that's an issue. And the final point I want to make, which is one that Julia made, uh, which is the extent to which uh, it's an attack on uh, women and minorities uh, in the Labour Party. I, it still shocks me to my core, being a feminist for uh, 50 more years, uh, that the Labour Party still refuses to recognise women as is important as men in it and never promotes uh, strongly uh, women in the Labour Party. And I, it just really is hurtful. And so the twin things for me have be, uh, that made me leave the Labour Party is the ways in which feminism isn't taken seriously as much as discrimination and racism aren't really taken as seriously as they should be. Thank you so much, Vicky. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And Naomi, it's uh, your turn to do your summing up. My turn, my turn. Okay, great. Um, yeah, it has been a great discussion and um, I'm sure hopefully people will go away and have, have this discussion with other people um, that would be useful and, and spread the word about Bob because one of the things that I think we, we've acknowledged tonight is that many, many people don't really know what the Ford report contained and in particular, as Richard said, they don't know what it recommended. And we still don't really know what the NEC is planning to do about those recommendations because the process is so opaque. So we mustn't let it go, uh, as John has said. But there's this question of if we can't have the serious discussions inside the party, where should we be having them and what should we be doing? And um, the Ford report itself hints at some of the important areas of activism that we all should be involved in i.e. various forms of racism because we live in a society now where divisiveness is a sort of acknowledged modus operandi from the uh, from from the ruling class and from the, the right wing and sadly increasingly far right elements in society so there are huge campaigns to be waged uh, against all forms of racism islamophobia is a particular area of concern which we have to be prepared to take up um, somebody mentioned the Labour Muslim Network earlier. We've got members of the Labour Muslim Network in this meeting, which is as it should be. Um, but there's also qu related questions about immigration, refugees, um, deportations. So many of these campaigns that are actually becoming more and more vociferous campaigns about Palestine and, of course, campaigns about the environment where that's where a lot of the action is going on because many young people particularly realize that we won't have a world to fight over if we, if we don't actually uh, sit up and take notice and we have tony booth our environment coordinator keen to mobilize people in in and uh, related to jvl who want to take up that that sort of work so i mean i think out there in the enough is enough campaign the burgeoning militancy in many many trade unions people's assembly activities and so on so there are many many forums and and in local local small groups as well mutual aid um food food uh, yeah uh, food banks and, and all these sort of things where there there are people who care deeply about the future of their communities and wider humanity and those are the people who should be with us building 
a socialist opposition to this terrible Labour government. So, oh dear, what did I just say? Terrible Tory government. And, don't do uh, that. <laughs> please don't quote me on that. Um, so, yeah, there are plenty of forums for us to be active in. And as Jonathan said, we're reviewing our strategy within JVL. Oh, yeah. Hope that people will um, join us in that process. Thanks very much to everybody for being here. And I'm looking forward to hearing how John wraps up the discussion. Yeah. Thank you. There's a couple of people, just before I bring John back, there's a couple of people who seem to have unmuted themselves. If they could re-mute, just because there's a little bit of background noise. Thank you. Um, I won't name names, but I think there were a couple. That's, I think that's better. John, you will have almost the last word. I get the last last word. No, I'll, I'll be as quick as I can. I thought the unmuting was to heckle. I thought there was going to be a bit of heckling to, to <laughs> liven up the meeting. <laughs> Anyway, let me just say, I, this, this has been a really good discussion, hasn't it? I, we've been able to express our views and we've been able to comment. That, uh, uh, not, I just think that we shouldn't be in what, so, uh, what some of the discussion, but we should avoid this uh, sort of attitude of, of maybe we're all in a collective depression. We're not. We're in difficult times and we're doing what we always do. We fight back and that's what we do. And eventually we win through. We've done it time and time have passed. Let me just do with some of the specific questions. I'll come on to what, uh, my view about, what, about where we go from here. Um, I'm really pleased David Rosenberg raised the mental health consequences of what's going on. The more that we explain to people, the, what, this, is, this whole issue around uh, the way people have been treated by the party, how it's impacted upon their lives, I don't think there's any thorough understanding of that. The number of people who I've said that have told me time and time again i just sat there and wept quietly that shouldn't be the way that people are treated to be honest so we should be raising that ruth mentioned about we're sticking by the rules but what about the example of audrey white challenging keir starmer in public um uh, when audrey got disciplined last time i was a character witness i think i was for naomi as well and every time i'm a character witness someone gets disciplined even more so maybe that's not the right approach but what all i'm saying is i think it's right that we challenge um decision makers we need to be careful about how we do that otherwise sometimes we can as i say people want us to rant and rave we've got to be the reasonable and rational people and even if that reason and rationality is ignored by some in power at the moment that reasonableness and rationality is directed at the rank and file mass of our members and that's the whole point really it is about trying to ensure that we put ourselves in the best and most effective position to mobilize the rank and file members in our in our party so that we can use what democratic mechanisms are still open to us to achieve position as well as change in behavior and change in policy and as of yet they haven't closed down the elections to the nec and that's naomi demonstrated we can win when we stand candidates and we get that broad range of support. And the, even if they are disciplined in Naomi, there'll be large waves of support for her because they see this as a potentially a way in which you can undermine those elections by preventing the person who's been elected taking position. Um, Rory raised the issue, sorry, Miriam Good raised the issue that's already been mentioned. Right? Will JVL be threatened with prescription? Um, I, I agree. Uh, what, what was said with regard to I th by Jonathan Rosenhead. I, I think in terms of just news management terms, in terms of public relations terms, they know I think that would be a disaster for them. But I just say this, it's very difficult for each one of us because we can go along to a meeting of any organisation thinking, well, it's perfectly proper, we're talking to anyone, then it gets prescribed and then they can use evidence against you from years back of that you were at a prescribed organization or you did an interview for their magazine or something like this so we're in quite difficult territory but increasingly i think we've got to use that as evidence that this system isn't working and isn't certainly isn't democratic uh, rory raised the issue about ford continuing to review um i'm asking to meet the ford panel um, to talk to them, to see whether or not um, they'd be willing to meet with a group, number of us, a group of us. And I don't want to betray a secret, but also um, a number of trade unions have um, asked for a legal opinion with regard to Ford as well. And we'll, we'll, we're, once we're in a position to publish that, I'll make sure it's circulated to JVL and, and see about that. Um, 
just coming on, I just want to come on to the main points really that people have raised. People are asking what's the motivation behind what's going on at the moment. We've got to recognize there are a small group in quite powerful positions at the moment who see the, the left as um, not just a threat to Labour being elected, they see the left as something that has to be eradicated for the long-term future, and not just of the Labour Party, of the country. There, there's, an obsessional, there's an obsessional view that you've got to eradicate the left. And that's why, if you remember, in some of the reports that were came out, were all referred to as trots and all this sort of thing. And some of them see it more important to eradicate the left than they actually winning a Labour government. And that's, I never thought I'd ever say that, but that's the reality of what's been, been evidences. And I've been saying to people around Starmer as well, and some of who, who were in his original campaign, don't think these people won't come for him if he stumbles in some way. And that's what happens if you allow this level of extremism to take over and start undermining our democratic processes. So what is to be done? What is to be done is that what we've got to do is rely upon our every democratic action that we can possibly take. And what the left always done and what people of goodwill always do when they feel there's an injustice, they organize and they maximize their interventions at every stage they possibly can and use every mechanism. I still think raising the issues that we've discussed today or attempting to raise them within constituency Labour Party and branches is important. And even if you're told we can't discuss it, just the act of raising it, I think is absolutely critical. But then we have to go beyond that. We should now be raising this issue within our trade union affiliates and every other affiliated body that we're members of, whether it's the SEA, the SHA and all, all the rest, even the Fabians, all of those organizations, just raising the matter, I think is absolutely critical. And I think you might find there's more people within the affiliated bodies that actually are up for a conversation about this, because they're anxious about the very democratic principles from which our party is organized. In addition to that, there's more, there are informal groupings as well that people are members of, whether it's Compass Progress, Momentum or whatever. I think we have to use those mechanisms too as much as we possibly can. It is about the, talk, the, what, the left media using as much as we can and every now and again, yeah, having a breakthrough into the mainstream media. You know, Jenny Manson, as a result of her absolute persecution of the BBC, um, got us into a discussion only a few weeks ago on the religious affairs program on a Sunday morning. I was first time I've ever appeared on a religious affairs program on a Sunday morning like that. But it, it was more that Rabbi Danny Rich made the best contribution of it all. So you just have to pursue and pursue and pursue. Can I also say one other thing? Just and I know you might think this is trivial, but it's the point that Naomi has just raised and others. Actually, having JVL as a visible presence. A lot of other struggles, I think, is incredibly important. Having JVL with banners and placards and all the rest of it, supporting striking pickets and all the rest, having us on, on the marches, having the banner behind speakers when people are speaking at rallies and things like that, just to say we're here, we're not going away. And actually, we'd want to raise a few issues in this discussion as well, because there's common principles and common struggles that we 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 have. And I think. It is important. And I just want to take on Richard Cooper's point. What are our demands at the moment? Actually, I think the central demand we should get behind, we could build popular support across the party on, is straightforwardly implementation of the Ford recommendations. Just this is an independent inquiry commissioned by Keir Starmer. And what we're loyally doing now is supporting his approach because we want those recommendations implemented. And I think those as a central demand of what JVL is saying at the moment, very difficult for the people to argue against. And if they do argue against, I don't think they'll be in a majoritarian position amongst the rank and file members of the Labour Party, and certainly not amongst our affiliates either. So I'm quite buoyant, buoyant about the mechanisms that we can use to, to go forward. And I think there's real opportunities of actually building something for maybe not immediate success, but certainly in, in the medium term, trying to turn, turn this around. If Labour does go into government, you know, the economic circumstances that we take over in this time are going to be pretty dire. It's going to be really tough for any Labour administration going into, into power itself. It will need and require the maximum support possible, but the base of that support will have to be its party members. 
what we've got to do is make sure actually they recognize it. The only way they'll secure that support is bringing, recognizing the broad church aspect of the party and the pluralism that we want. And we are determined parts of that, then we're not going away. Thank you. Thank you very much to John, to Naomi and to Miriam and to everybody for being here, for asking uh, such good questions and making so many good points. Um, 